Welcome everyone to VO Booth Besties. We're here to help working voice actors get your most important questions answered by industry pros who know. Each week we have a new topic and a guest speaker who is an expert on that topic. Did you miss a live episode? You can always catch the recording later on our website, boothbesties.com, or anywhere you find your favorite podcast. And be sure to join us in our VO Booth Besties Facebook group as well. It's really fun. Now, without further ado, let's meet our guest. Over to you, A.B. All right. Roy performs thousands of audio description or AD projects for film and TV. From his role as executive committee member of the Television Academy, or the home of the Emmys, to executive committee member of the Television Academy, I read that twice, um, to supporting SAG Awards inclusion of AD for screeners to his podcast, The ADNA Presents. With over 200 interviews from a with AD professionals, he uses his decades of experience in entertainment media to jumpstart sustainable parody opportunities for AD professionals and audiences. So thank you, Roy, for being willing to join with us today. We're excited to talk to you. And um, audio description in and of itself is is new to me. I, I came from a place of privilege of never needing to know about it. And I my mind is kind of blown with how important it is. Um, and so I know NJ is super excited about it. So for the rest of us who may be newer to this concept, tell us exactly what is audio description. Oh, I love this. It's so simple. Like in the world of audio description, which is also called description video or video description or descriptive narration, a describer who might be the writer or the narrator, or maybe it's both the writer and the narrator, or maybe it's the company, but not the production company, nor the distributor, but a special other company gives their creation of a split track or a mixed track of a narrator, if the film or TV show even has it, which is depending on the distribution channel, like streaming, theatrical, broadcast, physical, like Blu-ray or DVD, or downloadable to your iTunes or Google Play or even YouTube with any of these, each of which offers varying levels of access of audio description, either on an app or a TV or a cable box or a Chrome browser with a special built-in plugin or with YouTube. Maybe it's a separate YouTube video with audio description, but maybe the audio description separately is downloadable that syncs up and you can listen to a narrator or a synth voice. So it sounds like a conversational robot, or maybe it's a narrator that sounds like a synth voice, but you don't know until the audio description is there. And then when you hear it, maybe it's there. It could be a few minutes into the show. So you wait and wait and wait and hope. And then you don't hear it. So you have to decide to either stop and complain or just put up with it. But if you do decide to complain, who do you complain to? Is it the local broadcast affiliate or the movie theater manager who's dealing with Karen's complaint about her unpopped popcorn kernel? Or do you contact one of the 47 plus streaming services by mail, email, fax, Facebook, tweet, by phone? But to find that phone, you have to hunt down a number. And once you find that number, go through a press one, press three. Sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed or try a different number. And that is the main line. Ugh, press four, press zero. Holding. Okay, good. You can finally talk to a real person. It goes something like this. You answer their questions. Uh, Yeah, my speakers are working. No, audio description isn't closed captioning. Sure, I'll hold. Or better go through an accessibility web link. Buried so deep, it feels like they don't want to talk to you. And even when the audio description is there and it's bad, what does that even mean? Is the writing indicating things the visuals don't have? Does the narrator of a scary, suspenseful movie talk to you like you're a baby toddler? Does a kid's show have an uninterested adult narrating who sounds as tasteless as cereal too long in the milk? Or is it just that aforementioned synth voice like my friend Melody calls a puppet? Or even kind of creepy like a horror monster made to describe the lighthearted comedy romance film to you? And who chose that voice and why does that voice get in the way of your experience and you have to keep fiddling with the volume up and down and down and down and up to try to hear it depending on what's going on in the background or maybe the production audio ducks out of the way so you can hear the narrator but the other audio disappears out of the way and it's jarring and it takes you out of the story and does this work that's created for blind people actually include blind people in the process mm, maybe Um, okay, well, that thanks for the show, you guys. We can close up now. I'm <laughs> just kidding. That was honestly, um, I, I spent some time on the phone this afternoon with a friend of mine who is um partially sighted and uses audio description all the time. And she hit quite a few pain points that you just talked about right then and there. You know, there's so many things that that we don't even think about, right? When we're watching a movie that like that voice that that narrator voice you know or they're talking at you like you're a baby or they're not describing the big that there's a thousand people in the fight scene and you have no idea because they're only talking about one-on-one -on -one. there's a lot so but in a nutshell if we had to give it one sentence it's a verbal description of what's happening in between dialogue in a movie or a tv show like sure, that's great that'll work okay <laughs> so 
I think that anybody listening to this could really, from from what you just said, get a picture that there are some clear places where we could improve in the industry, right? This has been around for more than 30 years. And one of the things that I love about audio description, particularly with the streaming services, is that this focus that historically has been how cheap can we make it to check the box is starting to pivot. There's countless examples where people are branching out and exploring audio description in a way that enhances the professionalism of it. And how can that not affect the impact of our blind and low vision audiences in a way that brings them along into the story so that they don't get sucked out? I love that. Um, the example that she gave me was because I said, have you seen a shift in the last four to five years of of how well it's being done? And she said, yes. And the specific example she gave me was the Barbie movie that she said the audio description was done so well. And she the point she gave was like, oh, they Barbie's at a party and she's dancing and she's dancing with a Barbie in a wheelchair, which allowed her to understand the intent of that scene, not just what was being described on the screen. So do you, can you put a number on like a percentage of how many things that are out there have audio description versus not have audio description or is it, is it becoming more commonplace? One of the cool things in the last, I'd say five to six years is obviously streaming services, just the accessibility systemic use of audio description. In other words, the the audio description is kind of built into these streaming services, which makes it a lot more easier. And also a lot of blind organizations as well as blind audiences are fighting for more access and speaking up in ways that they haven't as loudly before. So when you look at the audio description project, the last time I checked, it was more than 10,000 projects of TV and film. That's just TV and film, not counting the other aspects of audio description. But I focus on TV and film, so that's my that's my that's my world. Right. When it comes to the the number of films that have it, I'm not sure, but let's go back to that number, 10,000. Uh, one of those 10,000 is a title. So a title could have a dozen episodes or 20 episodes or a long running series could have even more. So that number is, I think, underrepresented. It's just a title. So 10,000 compared to maybe even 10 years ago where it was just uh, maybe a, a few dozen to 100 obviously there's been a change in the quantity. Wow, that's pretty neat. Uh, when I started listening and, and talking to NJ talk about audio description, I got kind of emotional thinking about the fact that if any of my kids were to lose their sight, that they wouldn't be able to experience the same movies like Disney or Pixar that they had before. But it was really heartening to talk to my friend today and find out that Disney actually does a really good job with audio description um, and that she feels like they they really nail it when it comes to audio description. So it really clearly inclusivity plays a, a huge role in this, um, allowing someone who is blind or partially sighted to be able to experience the same experience, well, not the same, but to experience the movie in the way it was intended or the film in the way that it was intended. Uh, it kind of makes me want to marry all the things. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got into not only providing audio description for television and movies, but then to become an advocate for audio description in SAG? Yeah, I think we can step back just a little bit and and I'll answer your question by giving a little preface to it, that that emotional connection that you're thinking about with your daughter, that I'm going to use the word connection. You didn't say that, but that emotional experience, I believe it is connection. And being able to have that connection is a core uh, element of the advocacy that I'm that I love to be a part of and am joining many people and many people are joining me in that what that good job means in the sense of inclusivity that when we think about audio description that comparison to closed captioning is okay it's just capturing the visuals right it's so much more than that there's many different roles within audio description the writer the the audio description performer the quality control the engineer the the casting the directing all of these things come together. It's a fully produced audio program within an audio program. So that immersive experience that an audience member has to be able to experience a film like Barbie you mentioned or others mm -hmm. that really take care to make sure that the story is being told in a way that someone who's blind or low vision can immerse themselves into the story and not be distracted. That's part of what professionalism means. So when I started working in audio description, there were only a handful of projects that had it. And 
the the different companies that were approaching it were able to to bring their best, but there wasn't really a lot of attention paid to the individual skills. And I'll use the word talent, whether it's the writing or that quality control for consistency, or even the performers, like what we all do as voice talents, the, by emphasizing that, it gives our audience language to be able to distinguish what is a good job and what is a, a job that I'm like, oh, I'm kind of taken out. This, this is kind of that uncanny valley where things don't feel weird. Like someone just told me, the shark enters the gates of hell, it dies. Well, that sounds really conversational, but that doesn't make sense. So a lot of the work that I've been doing in, in advocating for audio description is not only awareness, but also awareness of what professionalism means within this industry. And if I may, the irony is uh, we, I, I, I'm not sure about um, all of us here, but I have been advocating for blind professionals to be a part of this work and behind the scenes, as well as in front of the scenes, I'm, I'm focusing on that because blind audiences have an absolute connection to understand what they want and what they need and how to get it. And as a sighted person, I need to be very sensitive to that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, it was this the saddest part I thought of the whole conversation that I had with her is when she felt like she had to explain to me just how grateful she is anytime there's any audio description. She's like, "Don't get me wrong, I, I'm just grateful that it's there," and and I thought, how sad to have to even express that. Like it should just be there, right? It should just be there. And she's like, "I feel like I can't even complain." if it's doesn't hit right and she you know she used an example of a movie that did like uh baby mama with T tina fey and uh amy poehler she said that the the audio description person they got was an actual female comedian yeah. so when she did the the description it she got the jokes and they landed and she understood what was happening in the nuances of the screen to to add to the description and that that was just such a great example. But then she gave a, a ton of examples that were not, that did not land, you know, like, like an old male narrating a female romantic comedy. She's like, it feels like when you're watching a movie that's a silly romantic comedy and your husband walks in the room and you feel a little like, well, I know this is dumb, but okay. She's like, that's what it felt like the whole time. Like it just felt off, you know, but we should, these opportunities should be there for them to, for anybody to be able to enjoy any movie and film. So um, thank you for your advocacy on it. And um, can you tell us a little bit about your podcast, the ADNA Presents podcast? Sure. It goes along with that uh, professionalism that a lot of people have been using a, a catch-all term to describe every role within audio description. And myself, I am a performer. So I take existing scripts that are given to me and I use those not just to read, but to bring intent behind it to, you know, I'm not a comedian, but I can bring, okay, so this, you know, this particular, there's a turn that's happening here, or this is a new scene or whatever, that those kinds of messages we can use with our intent in using the words. So the podcast started to help not only the audience, but also the people that are working in audio description to understand the impact and the work that goes into this, that I, I sense there was a, okay, just get it done and send it back when you're done. That it's it's this very uh, cog in a wheel sort of thing. And by showing all the many cogs <laughs> that are involved in it, I saw a lot of nuance that needed to be covered. I saw a lot of disagreements and different approaches, each of which were valid for various reasons. And to be able to highlight that and spotlight the contributions that these people had that are working in audio description, not just as performers like myself, but also writers and quality control and the inclusion of blind professionals in this work and the impact that they have had beyond just audio description, that this became a podcast that was more than just a library of how do you do audio description, but also giving a, a cultural uh, basically essence of, of what this means and the impact that it really does have. Awesome. All right. Well, JT, I'm going to turn it over to you to get into the fundamentals a little bit. Okay. So I would like to dig into some of the fundamentals of AD because it's so much different than what we do on an everyday basis. Can you describe the narration style of audio description? You mentioned like storytelling and inflection and emotion are important, but how do you manage getting the AD in a very short time between the dialogue? Yeah. In the, uh, 
that little dissertation I gave you just talking super fast. Um, there's a lot of times where audio description writing is uh, a little tight because we're fitting between lines of dialogue. And a lot of times it's like the, the hokey pokey, you kind of jump in and jump out really quick. Um, there's other times where the writer has a good sense of what's happening and there's, there's a lot of time and having the, the moments sync up with what's happening on screen as well as give the audience time to breathe and kind of absorb what's happening to be able to give that space. I think there's a, there's an intuitive thing that the voice actors have already built into their, to their skill set of being able to tell a story. So in that sense, that's a, a similarity between audio description performance and voiceover and that when you're bringing intent to words, when you're sharing a story, there's, you know, you could get into the technicality of, oh, my voice goes up here and then there's a long pause and then there's, we kind of stretch these words out. That's all very technical. But by approaching it with intent of what are you saying this and to whom, you're able to give a meaning behind the words in a way that, you know, I think all voice actors who, uh, who work in this business understand and have an innate sense of. I think the difference between audio description and, and voiceover, uh, to answer your question more directly, is that it is a very fast turnaround and each company has their own almost siloed individual approach to how audio description is done. So certain companies that I've worked for have a director and an engineer and it's like a typical voiceover session in a studio. Sometimes it's remote over a call like this Zoom call. Sometimes there's a script along with uh, content that's shared over a secure server and uh, we're able to to put that together within a certain deadline. So it's kind of like audiobooks where you got to get these 300 cues <laughs> to this film in time by the deadline. And then there's also some times where we as voice talents are playing the role of engineer. So it really varies depending on the various facilities, but... I find the audio description performance itself really takes elements of all aspects of voiceover in, in different ways and kind of cobbles them all together in a way that's it's really satisfying. So is it, I mean, you just described several different settings for actually doing the recording. When you're recording, is it kind of like dubbing? Do you get a, a countdown or a visual to know when to start and stop and how fast great, do you need to go? Really great question. Uh, I, again, it's I, I hate to say it, it's uh, it really varies on the company. So mm -hmm. there are certain times where if I'm being directed, it is similar to dubbing with the countdown. Uh, if I'm working on my own, there's I've got six different systems that I use for six different companies, and each company has their own approach. Sometimes the um, the AD writers, the audio description writers, are really cognizant of, okay, we've got, let's say, a 20-second block of time to say these two or three short sentences. They'll put in a, a cue, for example, uh, the word brisk or fast or pause or two-second pause, or they might even put in quotes what another character says so that we know as a voice talent to pause, let that person speak because we see it in the script, and then jump back okay. in. So those are those are just a handful of dozens of different examples. I find that a voice person, a voice talent that's getting into this work has to have that flexibility and adaptation to be able to say, oh, yeah, this company wants it this way, but this other company wants it the other way. And to be able to keep track and, and honor how their individual facilities process flow works. I mean, at this point, why isn't it why isn't there a standard? I can't answer that officially, but I can object, not objectively, anecdotally share that when it comes to this work, a lot of distributors, for example, the platforms like a streaming platform have taken up the mantle and said, hey, it's important for our audiences, meaning our blind and low vision audiences, to be able to access this content that sighted people have for, for granted. So by giving blind and low vision audiences access to this content, it helps their bottom line, which is great. So there's this win-win where it's like, we get more subscribers. And this is all speculation. I'm making this up. This isn't based on any research, okay. it's based on anecdotal. But I can see how the streamers understand the value of the 30 million blind and low vision Americans and all their family and friends. At the same time, 
because audio description, at least historically, hasn't been as known. In other words, production doesn't even know. And I've worked on so far three projects in the last five years where I knew the producers of a TV show and they didn't know that I worked on their own show. So wow. that alone, it's like, hey, you know that there are people that are deciding words for your film and there's a person that's reading words about your film and you have no creative input. Like that is a message. They're like, wait, what? I want to be yeah. involved, in that, you know? So it's, it's not lack of interest. But to answer your question, I feel this disconnect is when production connects audio description before it gets to distribution, that's going to solve a, a, a ton of problems. I almost swore. I almost said it's a dirty word, but I didn't. So do you think that um, now that it's becoming uh, at least a little more publicly recognized and the the networks and the the streaming services are becoming more aware of it is there an effort to kind of catch up on the the back volume of of things that don't have it yeah particularly last year during both strikes of the writers and sag aftra there was a you know it, what was that like however many months it was more than half a year cumulatively the there were a lot of backfilled titles so that is a problem. Uh, it's it's rare to go a week without someone saying, oh, what about this film? Um, on the ADNA.org, we have a page called The Wish List. And on the audio description discussion page on Facebook, there's also a, a similar wish list of people that are saying, hey, I want 007 or I want this. <laughs> and people are looking at it. I get messages, I'd say maybe two to three times a month saying, hey, you can remove this title because it finally has audio description. So somebody's paying attention. That's backgrounds. where I get real, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I couldn't, I can't <laughs> fast enough. I can't, I'm like, because I'm in the Facebook group and I see all these titles and I'm like, oh, I know that one. Like, oh my gosh, somebody said that they, that Lord of the Rings didn't, or maybe Lord of the Rings US, but New Zealand did or something like that. And like my mind exploded. I'm like, how <laughs> do I? Jen Greenfield is taking on the audio description for Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> I was like so excited. Yes. But you you again, like Alicia said, when you don't think about it, you don't realize there's just so many opportunities to support um, you know, adding AD to film, television. Anyway, I just had to jump. It's a great point. And to your point, you mentioned New Zealand and America and others that there are multiple times where I get a phone call from someone saying, hey, I replaced you on this project that you recorded or vice versa. The, there's one project for a full season had three different versions of audio description of the exact same show for the same facility. So again, I think going back to production owning this, um, that's a little outside of what you're talking about with these uh, library titles. But, you know, there's along with that chaos that we talk about when production owns the AD. The facility, sorry, the uh, the distributors already have the system in place to have AD. So thank you. You know, it's like, and they're going to be happy because now they don't have to, the distributors don't have to pay for it. It would be coming from production. Okay. So you kind of answered my, my next question. You know, who's deciding what film and TV shows are getting AD at this point? Oh, uh, and there are exceptions. There's, I, I don't mean to make this a blanket statement, but you know, I, I do want to congratulate the the streaming services for stepping up and, and doing this. And now the system is in place. I think this is the next step that this isn't a they did it wrong. It's a, and I'm not saying that you said that. I just want to be super clear that this is a work in progress, that we are stumbling through a lot of different accessibility pain points. And mm -hmm. now that the system is in place, having production to own it solves a ton of problems. I use the expression cinema to streaming to streaming that once production owns it, then it's easier to follow and it's easier to, to carry through. But there are exceptions. There are companies who actually have audio description writers on set for specific sci-fi uh, films. So there's a lot of really good examples. I'm working, I worked on a film that has open AD that's uh, premiering, I think next weekend in, in Hollywood for a film festival. And it's a, uh, it's great that the produ the production understood the value of audio description and also made it so that you can't turn it off. It is actually a part of the film. It is the film. So there's all sorts of different approaches that are happening. 
Okay. So that's open AD is like, it's there all the time. It's not a yeah. toggle it on and off. Can't shut it off. Okay. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. And I, also I can't that's... tell you how many times my husband's sitting across the room and he's going, what, what was that? Like, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> pause, rewind. Sure. And it's, so... it's funny because like on the other side, a lot of sighted people experiencing audio description, it's too much. It takes like a few mm -hmm. minutes depending on the film or TV show to get used to it. It's like, I'm seeing what I'm hearing and I'm hearing what I'm seeing. It's too much. Stop. But once you get into it, there is this adjustment and acclimation. So who's primarily casting for these jobs? There's a handful of companies that are, uh, I'll call them AD facilities that are uh, one-stop shops. So you go as a distributor or a film production company, you go to these companies and you give them a film and then they create the audio description and send it back to you, whoever you are. So uh, there's a, there's more than a handful of them and each individual uh, facility, audio description facility uh, usually does internal casting and primarily they have a pool of, of talent that they use, but there are exceptions to that. As we talked about with production owning audio description, as well as distributors taking a stronger interest in the the quality control. The example gave earlier with uh, uh, you said about you know a, an old white dude doing a romantic comedy that that's that's going to take you out. Yeah. The, the the companies that are hiring the AD facilities are having a, a stronger impact on casting, on quality control, and on performance. Netflix uh, has publicly shared their requirements for what that performance is for audio description. That's great. That's a great start. Um, just a quick switch. Um, what does coaching for audio description look like? Uh, for my coaching, I historically have done two different approaches. The first is a workshop where we get people up to mic, so to speak, virtually. Uh, we do it uh, American Idol style without the um, the judgment or elimination. So basically, we have some blind advisors who are uh, primarily in quality control or uh, AD writers or other AD performers who are blind and, and give feedback. And that's been a, a tremendous impact for everybody involved to be able to get feedback that some voice talents have never gotten before of, oh, I heard this in your voice and it kind of took me out or, hey, this really worked well. And people are like, I've never gotten that kind of feedback before. So there's there's a yeah, real benefit amazing. to that. And also, as we said earlier, as blind people are involved in this work, compensating them for their contribution is an important part of it. So the workshops are, I try to facilitate so that we get as many people up to the mic as possible. I keep the classes small. I also have done some coaching on the uh, I guess the, let's call it the career or professional side of, of helping guide people based on their existing skills and where they want to go specifically within different areas of audio description and how that could best be realized without reinventing the wheel, so to speak. Like what skills do people already have that they can bring to audio description that they might not have thought of before? So those are the two different approaches that I've been, that I've been taking. Okay. I'm going to quick turn things back over to AB because we are at the halfway mark. Yes, and our halfway mark is where we talk about our amazing sponsors who make it all possible. Uh, not really, but they do definitely help. Uh, our sponsor is Studio Bricks, and that I am in a Studio Bricks booth. So for anybody watching who isn't familiar or listening, voice actors have to have a quiet space to record. And in our modern society full of planes and trains and automobiles and screaming babies in the room next door, uh, it sometimes can be hard to find a quiet space to record. And the Studio Bricks provides voice actors that freedom and flexibility to record regardless of what is happening in their external surroundings. So check out Studio Bricks. They are a, um, it's studiobricks. Mm, I shouldn't have pretended like I know the website. Just Google Studio Bricks and you'll find it. And um, I truly believe that my investment in Studio Bricks helped my career to really be able to become a full-time thing and to be something that I could invest in fully. So that's my little nugget for Studio Bricks. And you guys okay if we ask a couple of questions from the chat? We actually have some good engagement in the chat right now. So um, 
Yeah, leaf blowers. Studio Bricks keeps us from worrying about leaf blowers and lawnmowers and all of the things. So, Roy, a few questions um, from the chat. Someone asked, is there anybody trying to attack audio description for stage? And are you familiar with that? Oh, what a great question. So there's a, there's a handful of people that work in live audio description for theater, uh, Kennedy Center specifically. And there's a, a touring company that goes out of Chicago and also, I believe, Texas. Um, so on that front, it is really interesting that the audio description is, let's start with the experience for the audience, that a blind or low vision audience member shows up maybe 15, 20 minutes early and gets a, a tour of what the costumes feel like or what the sets look like or what characters are. So they can kind of have that that sense of not having to to jump in, not knowing what's happening, that they get a an actual feel of what they're about to experience. And then the experience itself is usually, in this case, it most likely is one person who has attended rehearsals and has written their own script and also done some run-throughs. So it's a, it's a much different experience than TV and film, which is pre-recorded, because it is, in most cases, live. They have experienced it with uh, pre-recorded, but I, I think most companies are now still doing it live. So... Um, but there's uh, small individual theater companies that do audio description, uh, particularly here in L.A. There's a there's a handful. Uh, sorry, handful. There's one or two that I know of specifically. I'm sure there's more. But most cities do have accessibility for their um, for their live theater, you know, as well as museums or national parks. That's right. We thing. also have a colleague, um, Bryson Carr, uh, who he did live AD for the Grammys. So you, when you just think about, and you know, like, and and also um, parades on um, uh, what, like Macy's Day Macy's Parade, Day and parade. Things like that. Yes, thank you. Um, gosh, so many opportunities that we just don't we don't think about. So on the live side, I had pitched to uh, a few organizations to have a a blind live audio description performer to and to make that happen was not that big of a leap. There were a lot of prep work that that needed to happen and access to the production, but uh, there's been a few companies that have embraced that and gone forward with it. And it does make, a, uh, it makes such a difference. I, I do hope that for the upcoming shows that they do name the, the voice talent. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Bryson gets credited for his work, but as you know, for for other live announcers, they are they are named and being able to name the blind live AD performer, I think, is uh, is really important. Awesome. Um, next is. Uh, I mentioned the Barbie movie. Do you have any examples that you can throw out of episodic series or movies that would give us a sense of what well done audio description sounds like if somebody wants to check it out? Oh, I love that. It's, as you can guess, it's kind of subjective, but I think there's a comparison to be made just to give you a litmus test that, uh, let's say audiobooks. at least this has been my experience. There might be a book that I'm so excited to read and I get the audiobook version of it and I can't make it 20 seconds. It's, and it's not just cause I'm a, I'm a voiceover actor. It's cause it's just, it's ingratiating. It's so whatever that thing is that I need to turn it off. Audio description is similar, that if you're experiencing something and two minutes into it, you're kind of shaking your head and squinting and wanting to kind of step back or wanting to turn it off and turn something else on, it's likely that the audio description isn't meeting what you're doing. But if you're like five, 10 minutes in and you're engaged with the story, the characters are coming alive and you're feeling that emotional connection, that tells me that the audio description is working the way it's meant to, that our work is disappearing into the story. That's when it's done professionally. And that's a high wire act when it's done right. So to give you specific examples, I think it's the individuals to go into the, the many streaming services, turn on the AD and experience it yourself and say, you know, get over that. If you're sighted or if you're blind and new to audio description, there is that adjustment phase where it's like, what's happening? But once you get over that, then you can start to experience the performance and the writing and the mix and all those elements that can make or break uh, a good audio description track. So I, I'm kind of punting. I'm not giving you a specific example, uh, but. Uh, I, I will. I'll give a specific example because I sent it to the ladies because it's one that just 
I think, well, it's short and it's beautiful, but uh, to our viewers and our listeners, after, after we're done, don't leave us yet. After we're done, pop over to YouTube and put in Lion King audio description and get ready for some beautiful writing, some beautiful storytelling, some beautiful imagery, and it doesn't matter age, gender, you will it'll pull you in. So that yeah, I'm gonna, I have that. to I have to add one cuz there is one that I I I do need to mention cuz it is so specific and it came out like 10 15 years ago. Uh it's Stevie Wonder's video called What the Fuss and Buster Rhymes does audio description for it. Oh wow. That sounds fun. Um I I'll also my friend that's uh in the she's actually in the chat and she shared a couple of movies with me that she felt like were really really well done and that she appreciated john wick and um the marvel movies she said that the marvel movies are really well done and you actually almost get a behind the scenes kind of view that that if you're not super familiar with the marvel comics there's things that little nuggets and easter eggs and things that are in there that they tell you and um she appreciated that she said also disney yeah. films and pixar are great and um, Marvel is a good example of how it can still be entertaining for sighted folks to listen to the AD, the AD at the same time as they watch. Um, let's see. There's a couple other questions, but I, I want to give NJ still some time. Um, oh, are there any production companies who are still resisting adding audio description because they feel like it disrupts the integrity of the film? And if so, where does she need to write old man letters to? <laughs> old man letters. Wave that cane above your head. There is, uh, you know, it's it's funny. I'm I'm focusing on highlighting and pointing out the models of progress, like going in the right direction. So those examples that you just gave of Marvel and earlier Disney, those two are tied together. Pixar also, there was a, a panel that focused on audio description from the Pixar perspective. So that kind of work together really does make a difference. When I've had conversations with someone who's new to audio description and is able to make a decision, it's not that big of a leap. They get a clearer sense that, you know, there's there's this trepidation or fear of they don't want to do it wrong. And it feels like it's this leap across an ocean where actually, yeah, there's there's definitely some some adjustments, but the leap isn't as big as they think. And once they do experience it, it's great. Let me give you a specific example with SAG Awards. That their screeners, that's not streamers, but screeners, the 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 content that you watch before you vote. Audio description became a requirement for those qualifying uh, screeners. And wow. it was done because of the Performers with Disabilities Committee reached out to SAG Awards and said, make it a requirement. And there was initial resistance, you know, requirement. It sounds so permanent and final. But the results of that were... The, the companies had a huge lead time to be able to prepare for it. And also my favorite win, and this is along the, the sense of modeling, because one of these particular series did not know about audio description and wanted to qualify to be nominated for the SAG Awards, they added audio description. And it's one of those shows that has spinoffs. And so because of that, now other content has audio description because production became aware of it, because SAG Awards, because... Performers with disabilities made it a requirement and not a recommendation. So all these things, I think they're all connected. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. I kind of pivoted a little bit, but. No, that the, was great. Okay. Um, NJ, I want to turn it over to you and you can ask that last question when you're ready. Yeah. So, okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. So within these production houses, so let's, I'm going to kind of differentiate. So between production, you know, the producers and the film actually being developed, but we'll call it the production houses. Are there separate AD writers, narrators, producers, are and engineers, or are there are there folks, I was gonna say guys, I don't like to say guys, but you know, are there folks that are just trying to do all of it, that are trying to write it and narrate it? Because I I understand it's kind of a low budget gig to this point, right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the roles because okay. I, I love distinguishing the different roles. And there are art auteurs in every creative artistic medium. You know, there's the directors who are also actors and writers and producers. You know, uh, Ben Affleck and uh, Matt Damon wrote and starred in 
their show that kind of launched, you know, way back whenever they would, they did a uh, goodwill hunting. So there are overlaps, of course, I feel like distinguishing the roles, you know, I've been producer, I've been writer, I've been performer, I've been quality control, I've been each role, but I really try to distinguish the roles because it does make a difference, even if it's the same person doing different roles within a TV show and film. So that's just an important part to me. To answer your question, I'll I'll say the the AD facilities, the 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 place that makes it, just to make it easier. Yeah. The AD facilities, they do have some overlaps. And if a voice talent is interested in writing, that's going to help them because that's yet another skill. And uh, so that's there's there's different ways. You know, I've I mentioned earlier. Sometimes I am engineer as well as voice talent. So those are two separate roles. If I'm placing something in between lines of dialogue that is editing yeah are are people i i meant to ask this or bring this up earlier is doing audio description is that a am i, am I doing that through source connect is it self-directed am i getting is there some software that is just for audio description Great question. Uh, there's so many different approaches and each company has their own requirements okay. some require a a very specific program to download and install. And there's one program that I spent quite a lot of money on and several months of, of coaching out of my own pocket, getting trained on it. And then there's others that I launch a, a web browser app and click a few buttons and it does most of the work for me. There's others where I'm directed. So uh, I, I've done Source Connect, I've done Zoom, I've done self-record, upload a WAV file from my side. It's It really runs the gamut. Okay. It it seems it seems so interesting that that certainly from an engineering side this isn't a streamlined process yet that there would be so many different ways to approach it that seems kind of counter doesn't it? It it is and each siloed company has a real benefit to the way that they do it like okay. this company over here has this thing that works really well and makes it so good and then this company over here has this other thing that they're doing and then this other company makes sure that blind professionals have quality control with the accessibility needs that they have so it's there is I, i'd love for it to be one size fits all at mm -hmm. this point and maybe even in the future I, that may not happen but there are consistencies and i feel okay. like the we can we can step gently into the technology side and say that as technology eliminates the repetitive non creative tasks it unleashes the creativity of 80 writers 80 performers and quality control in a way that that really enhances all right so i know the answer you know the answer share with us how important the actual writing is when it comes to ad i mean i know the narration the storytelling the emotion the inflection of course just like you were talking about in an audiobook you know what is going to be engaging and keep my attention but if the writing is giving things away if the writing is too sparse and not actually giving me enough, can you kind of speak to the importance of the writing when it comes to audio description? Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it just for a very brief moment, focused okay. on the performer. Okay. They, our job is to bring that script to life the best we can. And based on the relationship with the AD facility, there sometimes are spaces for that. Um, but in the, like the collaboration, the world, you mean? Yeah, that's, it, it definitely steps into something that's beyond what our role is as a voice talent. Like you can imagine as an audiobook narrator going to the writer and saying, this part doesn't make sense. I'm not going to read it, that that's not going to fly. I think that's a yeah. very, so there, there's a real, and again, professionalism in the sense of you are being paid to provide a service, whether or not you agree with that. Sometimes we do things that, you know, might not be the best choice in the context of what you're talking about. I'm not saying that we should cave in, but I'm also not saying we should walk off, that there is this nuance even there. So to answer your question, writing is 90 to 95 percent of this work, that yeah. it is so important and it takes so much skill. This is more than just a screenplay writer. It's uh, And if anyone's interested in writing, adtrainingretreats.com is the place where most AD writers who are working regularly for some of the more recognizable titles have taken that that course of uh and again that's ad training retreats for audio description training retreats ad training retreats.com 
Colleen knows what she's doing. So there's there's opportunities to learn how to do this with, you know, workshop the writing. I know we're talking about voiceover, so I want. No, be- I know, I know, and I'm, but that's, but I'm so excited about the production side. That's just, I'm. Sure. That's all these two ladies hear about is I'm like, I love it. right? I gotta produce. I gotta be the engineer. I can't wait to tackle this enormous uh, whale. But anyway, um, back to the, um, uh, you know, talking about um, kind of the processes. Interestingly enough, you've mentioned so many times not only bringing in, uh, giving the opportunity for. Um, partially sighted or blind folks to not only do audio description, voice it, narrate and, and help write. But, you know, it's kind of like, um, we had, um, a fantastic Latin American panel. And one of the things they harped on was like, when we go into a directed session in Spanish, if someone isn't actually Spanish, like in the room, when you have someone who's not native and trying to give direction that doesn't match, I'm curious, has it gotten more common for blind or partially sighted people to be, yeah, in the process, but almost maybe QC existing work or work that's about to be produced to go, yeah, this resonates? Or is or are you just closing your eyes, I'm being a little exaggerating, and just trying to make sure everything lands? It's uh, blind professionals, particularly on quality control, make a, a world of difference. Excellent. It, yeah. it is it is different than us sighted people closing our eyes. Yeah. Um, and there's the companies that are publicly talking about it, I think are uh, along that line of modeling it. I think that's that's helpful with all the production that I've done as a audio description producer. I always include blind professionals in every aspect that I can. So Excellent. I've experienced the the benefits of that. And I'm, it just makes sense. There's no reason to not hire blind professionals yeah, because of that. the work that goes into it and the, the and it's, uh, yeah. It's adding, it and it's adding inclusivity on all levels. It's bring you know what I mean? It's not, well, look, us nice sighted people threw you a bone and gave you some audio description. No, now you're also voicing it. Now you're helping write it. Now you're, I mean, like there, there's just, it's an opportunity. It's, it's nothing but positive opportunity inclusivity. And I just. And Jen, to your point, this is a microcosm of accessibility in general. We talk about DEI uh, and add the A for accessibility that as audio description can model why inclusion matters specifically on the accessibility side for disabled professionals of all kinds. So I, um, okay, so now I'm going to kind of, I'll stay on track here, I think. So AD to this point, if you were to, you know, categorize it, is considered post-production. Is that accurate? Like dubbing? I'd push it even further. I think it's post-post currently. Okay. So that said, one of the things you've talked about, we've talked about, I've been a part of discussions. I've listened to interviews with folks who are, who are really trying to get AD to be part of, I mean, it should be written in when the screenplay is being written. Like it should be so that they're the director's intention, the writer's, you know, POV, all of these things. It could be, it needs to be included on the front end. And here's what's interesting is I I, I just finished up, um, I was a lead in a short film down in, in Tucson for um, a, a senior student thesis. And I told her, I was like, and they're doing a huge, it's a big deal. They're doing a huge um, premiere for all the films and all the things. And it's red carpet and it's dress up in the whole nine yards. And I asked her, I said, have you thought about audio description? And she went, no. And I'm like, let me help you. Cause I said, cause I said, are your professors talking to you about it? And she goes, they've never mentioned it ever. And I was like, so, so that's where I'm going with this is, so now you've got kids in film school. Now you've got maybe professors, old school professors, or, you know, just, it's not even being taught. So for me to tell her about it, I'm sending her links. I'm sending her examples. And she goes, I want everybody to have access to my film, but kind of like how you said, some of these networks, they only got excited when they knew there was SAG was part of it. So same thing with her is I said, nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to have it. You would be the only film to have this as part of the premiere. And I'm like, just think of the, you know, 
how you would stand out. And she was like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. But it, it planted the seed that forever and always every film she does, that this can be part of, cause she also wrote this one. So I'm like, you start doing it on the front end rather than making the, it this post post thing. What a difference it makes for the experience, for, you know, your message, your vision of the film and to be able to include more people in it. So there you go. And that's another example of modeling. This is like popcorn. Yeah. Yep. I love it. Um, mm, 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 are movie shows. Nope. We already talked about that. Okay. So we, this has been amazing. Uh, all right. So there was one more question. Do those facilities. Okay. Oh, localized audio description. So we're digital, right? Like we can, you can contact me in Scottsdale, Arizona. You could contact someone in, in Germany. Hey, we need this, you know, so are we seeing multiple languages being offered with audio description? Are we seeing, um, uh, yeah, where it's almost dubbing, but not dubbing, you know what I mean? Where it's in, and using localized audio description with different studios, or is this all kind of happening in the U S so great example here, uh, depending on let's, let's set aside the, uh, we're only going to focus on what you're talking about here in this example, okay. the Apple TV plus has broken the barriers of regionalism. So what that means is that you can watch audio description of a Japanese language and be in Germany and hear the Spanish. Like it, I, that's a terrible example. My point is that there is no regionalism when it comes to T Apple TV Plus. And they have, I believe, nine different languages of audio description. But are they, is it synthetic voice or is it actually human narration? Or do you know? Uh, it is, I think you'll be able to tell. Okay. But they do hire multiple oh. languages of talents. Okay. I will say that. Okay, all right, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, so uh, the the point is that there's, you can, in the sense of localization for AD, there are multiple languages. Cause there are, believe it or not, there are blind people that don't just speak English. I think is what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, okay, so one of the questions in the chat was, I would love to ask about the new film, The Zone of Interest, and films like it. I haven't seen it. I'm sorry, so I don't know what part we're referencing. Where it, where sound is such a big part of it, and then it's subtitled. Hmm. Can you speak to this? Like, how do you tackle I'd love to. Um, let me speak aspirationally first. That if a, a film is done in a different language, in other words, as a as an English speaking person, I would watch the subtitles as a sighted person, as a sighted English speaking person, I would okay. watch the subtitles. If I'm a blind person, English speaking, and there's a film like Parasite that comes out, which is not in English. Yeah. That I'm speaking aspirationally and idealistically that we've got some really super talented dubbing performers that have probably already dubbed these shows mm -hmm. and incorporating that dub into the audio description track oh, no. solves six problems. What's happening now is there are some super talented voice talents in audio description who can do multiple voices, who are actually dubbing actors. And they're being, and again, beautiful performances where they're doing five or six different characters isolated and it's this person here and this person there, just like dubbing. The challenge is our audio description audiences are going into this film that cost multi-millions of dollars and they're getting a one-person show. If I went to Broadway and I'm all excited to see some new musical and it turns out to be a one-person show, there's a part of me that's going to be disappointed, even if the person's super talented. I feel like I've been shorted somehow. So back to the aspirational side, when audio description can be included in production, then yeah. the dubbing can be included in the audio description. And now the audience can get that fully immersive experience of the performance of the dub along with the audio description. That's a win. But currently, there's a ton of really talented voice talents that are being put in the position of basically eliminating a lot of dubbing roles. 
Interesting. And it's and not their fault. That's not a blame. So in talking to, this was one of Renee, my friend's issues was she said it, it's hard for you to know when it's a subtitle, when it's the same narrator, when somebody's talking, 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 and then they're reading the subtitle, you, as the unsighted person, the not the blind person, you can't tell that someone else is talking until you kind of get into it. And so she says it takes her out of it just for a minute. And it would be so nice if it was a different voice. That's, That's just a great point. Such and a it's really, also, yeah. there's a way to perform it so that you can go from quote unquote narrator performer right. to the, I know that, but to your point, like audiobooks. but still to your point, you're right. She shouldn't have to have that because no sighted person has got to experience that. Wait, what? And like, that, I'm taken out. Anytime that you're taken out, that means that we drop the ball on the audio description. And, that's and she was just happy for them to do it in a different, their own different voice, yeah, like an I audio mean, book. But even if it's, if it's a different, if somebody's already done the dubbing on it, why not utilize that? Exactly. Yeah. And it feels like it's yet another form of discrimination that the audience is not getting that fully immersive experience that the sighted people get. With no judgment on the performers. This right. is not a you know finger point here. Can we go back to um, the zone of interest? Because that popped up another yeah, question about this. Um, how how does AD handle diegetics? Diegetics is great. I think there's an example from five, 10 years ago of someone involved in audio description who connected with the producer. And I'm, I'm using an example. I'm not sure if this was specific. They, uh, It was a beach scene. So instead of the audio description saying, on a beach, what they did was add the waves or the seagulls or some children playing in the background. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Yeah, when the, um, when the character is reacting to a sound that they've heard, how do you kind of incorporate that into the audio description in an effective way so that it's not just a sound like... The Mockingjay in the um, just, uh, Serpents and, oh gosh, the, with you. the, the prequel, the, the prequel that just yeah. came out. Yeah. Um, so like the, the bird sound is an important part of that. Yeah. And the character reacts to it in a good audio description. I would think you would have to convey that that's important and the character's reacting to that sound. Sure. Uh, I'm... I might be uh, going off, but I think there's a, a fair comparison to an audio description scene where there's one person who we know has a gun and it goes off. We hear it go off. If we hear she shoots the gun, it's like that's not needed. That's an over that's an unnecessary. Like if we know there's one person, but if there's two people that are fighting over a gun. And it's, let's say, a, a male and a female, and she shoots the gun. You can already hear the distinction is on the she, not the shooting of the gun. Because we need to know, wait, who shot who? Because mm -hmm. that's ambiguous. So in the example with mocking, uh, the mocking Jay, I think there's a, there's context. And that a, a good AD writer is able to recognize and trust their audience to know this is going to be something they need to know. I'm not sure if that's fully answering the question. Uh, yeah. But, okay. Well, and again, we've, we, we, we did touch on this and I think, you know, it's important JT brought back up just the nuance of the writing that it just is so, it's just so important. Um, so, okay. Our last question is now that our audience has been introduced to this, um, can we connect with you on LinkedIn or what is the best, I shouldn't have said that, but what is the best way to connect with you to learn more about your coaching? Um, maybe you can share, you know, how can people get into AD? I mean, I'm, there's going to be a, a starting point and I imagine it would be talking with you or one of your colleagues. I love anyone. And I would, if I had $16 million, I would pay everyone $10,000 to spend 30 minutes to listen to the podcast called A Thousand Words on 20,000 Hertz. It's um, It goes into a lot of the things that we've talked about, and it's a beautifully woven story. This is a podcast that focuses on sound exclusively. And for them to, I think this is their third audio description episode. It's again called A Thousand Words. I think that's a super important place to start. Great. Um, on the ADNA.org, it's not a casting service. It's more like 
the internet movie database of AD. So you can kind of track, oh, I did this person, uh, you know, uh, perform this show or did this writer do that show? It's not, it's audience contributed. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not connected to production, but the intent is there. And then obviously those podcast episodes, the, um, on the ADNA.org, it's called the ADNA presents. That's where the, those interviews are. And it, any single one of them is going to bring some sort of insight. As far as me, my social media seems to be primarily on LinkedIn. When I am on social media, I've taken a very deliberate step back over the last year or two and I'll be, I'll come back. But for now, that seems to be the best way to connect. And, uh, my email address is uh, my name. So it's Roy at RoySamuelson.com. All right, AB, you want to finish this up? You yes, are sorry. Here. I was putting his uh, email in the, in the YouTube chat. Um, okay. So Roy, thank you for this time. It, I, we, that hour flew by and I feel like, I thought I knew everything about voiceover and I, I feel like I've gained a totally different perspective today. And I really appreciate th that and your time. But before we go, we like to ask our guests some just for fun questions, just to hey, get to know I a little bit those. about you. Okay. So what show or series are you binge watching right now? True Detective Night Country. True Detective. Ooh, that sounds good. I might have to add that to my list. What is your dream vacation? A train ride and reading a book. <laughs> that sounds great. We have a train in the Great Smoky Mountains that you can do like a three hour train ride. I could, that would be, that would be great to just read a book. And what is your go to shower singing or car singing song? It is both Taylor Swift and Lil Yachty. I love it. I love it. That sounds like so much fun. So, JT. All right. Well, a huge thank you to everyone who joined us today. We had a really great audience on YouTube. Uh, if you're catching this on replay, um, you can find it on the VO Booth Besties website. You can find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Join us live every Thursday on YouTube at 10 a.m. Pacific or 1 p.m. Eastern. And again, if you've missed a live episode, go back and find it. And we would love that uh, for you to leave us a review tell your friends about it, um, like and subscribe because those reviews help us get more listeners who are looking for great voiceover content. And next week, join us when we talk to the folks at Lotus Productions, Jim Canelli and Sam Ufrit. Thank you for being here and have a fantastic day.